The following is a clip from Kentucky Sports Radio, which airs Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to noon on stations throughout Kentucky and streaming on iHeartRadio. To hear the entire episode, download the podcast on the iHeartRadio app. On the phone, UK's athletic director, Mitch Barnhart. Mitch, thank you very much for the time. No problem, Matt. Glad to be there. All right, so there's a lot of stuff to get to. Let's start with this. I haven't got, haven't heard that you, uh, ha- haven't, I haven't heard you talk about it. What's your take so far on the basketball season and where we are right now, as of now, with the basketball program? Well, I mean, obviously, we all want to win. Um, our coaches are fully engaged in that. Cal is. Now I reflected back um, as I look back. At March 16th last year, we were 26 and seven, and we're one win away from being a one seed, and and had a national player of the year with a, um, a young man who obviously returned our program with with high aspirations of of duplicating that. So you know we're not where we want to be, and no one is. But the coaches are. We got you know Cal's a Hall of Fame coach, and he is, he's un, been unbelievable in the past of finding a way to get our team better as we go through the season. And so we're, we're in a tough stretch right now, and we got to find our way through that. And, and I know our, our coaches and, and our players are committed. I saw several of them at the women's game last night. They're out watching our women um, play South Carolina last night, and, and I had a chance to bump into a couple, two or three of them. And, and uh, they are fully committed to, to obviously getting – to getting better and finding a way to get us to postseason play and making a run at it, and I, I know that's on their hearts and they're and they're working hard, and I know the coaches are working hard, and and um, and I've, I've seen Cal do this many many times, and I think back to the, you know, the season we went to Dallas for the Final Four, we were in a similar spot mid season, and we were able to turn it around and get it going, and so I have I have confidence that this guy is is done it before and he can do it again, and I'm looking forward to um, hopefully finding a way to get better. So you are confident in Cal Perry's ability to turn it around. I guess I would ask you, do you think there are changes that he or the, the, the basketball program need to make? Yeah, you know, Matt, I've never micromanaged our coaches. That, that's they're, they're the CEOs of their ship, and, and I've, I don't get into the daily grind of, of how they prepare and what they want to do. That's what they do. That's what they're paid to do, and, and I, they do it well. We've got – I guess 17 head coaches and 11 have been with me longer than 10 years. And we've sort of given them the freedom to be able to do the things that have made most of them the winningest coaches to ever be in our program. So most of them have done that. And, and, um, and for a long time for Kentucky and, and I'm confident that, that Cal knows the, the buttons to push to, to uh, get us in the right spot. We've, we battled some injury bugs. We've, and we've battled some, some confidence bugs and hopefully we can get those things put behind us and, and uh, and we've got we've got 14, 15 games left in the regular season here. We can and, and make this and get it where we want to get the postseason and make a run, which is we're famous for doing that, and and Cal's teams are famous for doing that. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. All right. So I, I don't think it's a secret. There was an article that came out yesterday from Cal Tucker with the Athletic. It had a lot of stuff in it. So I just want you to be able to address the various parts of it. Let's start with the first part, which was. Uh, Calipari, which was Kyle Tucker said that Calipari has $30 million in pledges from former UK basketball players that he, uh, has, ha, that they have said would help build a new practice facility and you have said no on that. Is that true? And if it is, why? So, you know, I think that if you look at our history, Matt, we've done almost a half a billion dollars in capital construction since I've come on as athletic director for all of our sports programs, including basketball on multiple fronts. That does not even include um, the almost $200 million at, of renovation at Rupp Arena. That's not in my DNA to turn away help for capital construction. Having said that, coaches all the time offer their help in the fundraising packages, and Cal has offered to help, and he's done that on multiple occasions to, to help us raise money, and we work in conjunction with the K fund, we, but those are, that, those are also hopes. And when you say you've got $30 million, you think you can do $30 million. There was no, there's not pledges in hand. Those are things we hope to do together and get to a spot. But those processes in construction, just for everyone's information, are 18 to 24 month processes. So even if we started last summer, it would be absolutely the summer, probably or the fall or summer 
18, 24 months away from that to be able to go through design, through funding, the approvals through the trustees in the state, as well as get to get shoveling grounds and get it going. And then along the way, there's this thing we've got to make sure we're in, con- we're in cahoots with, and that's the master plan of the university for spacing, as well as Title IX and gender equity, which means whatever we do for, for men's programs, we're going to have an equal space and equal opportunity for our women's programs, which is critical. So that facility in that, in that context is probably a 75 to $80 million facility. So you're not even halfway home and we've got to figure, we would have to figure the rest out. So just because even if we had pledges in hand, it's not going to allow you just to begin to go, Hey, tomorrow we'll go throw a building together and, and put a shovel in ground. So uh, we're not against facility expansion. I think that's very well indicated by our history of what we've built to support all of our programs, not the least of which, on top of that, um, in about, oh, you know, three or four months, we're absolutely um, looking forward to the renovation of the most historic facility on the University of Kentucky campus, which is Memorial Coliseum. Uh, it was built in the early 50s, and we are going to gain approvals for that, we hope in February, which has been a long process to get to this spot of funding and approval to get Memorial done, which will help all of our sports programs, including our men's basketball program. In some way, shape, or form, it's going to touch everybody. So, but, uh, but okay, I, that all completely makes sense to me, but just, just to nail you down on two things. One, you're, you're saying you don't necessarily believe there are $30 million in pledges. And two, you've never said to Cal, no, you can't build the facility. Is that, are those true? Yeah, no, I, 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 no, let's not, let's not, I want to get to the spot where I'm saying, you know, I'm, I'm disagreeing with my coach here publicly. That's not where we want to be. We're, we've had conversations about a facility. He would like to have a new facility. There's no question about that. I get that. But at the end of the day, there is a a significant process, and we've explained that to everyone, that we have to go through to get that done. That's number one. Number two, I think that he thinks he can go raise $30 million, and he should. He's got got lots of friends in the basketball community that have absolutely got the ability to help us, and we would love to have that help. I think what he was saying, and I will confirm that he has said, uh, I think I can do that. And that's a part of it. That's probably about 40% of the project. So but what I'm saying to everyone understanding the process and that's what we've explained to everyone in this in this conversation is yeah you can start there but before we can get started you've got to have this much funding you've got to have a design you've got to have a fit a master plan you've got to have an equality piece for gender equity and at the end of the day then we can get going but it takes significant time these are not snap your fingers things and that's what was has been explained it wasn't no, it was here's the process. And at the end of the day, um, absolutely would always welcome our coaches' help in fundraising, realizing at the end of the day, most of the time, it ends up where we have to get the rest of the help from our K-Fund staff and all the work we do with our donor base, who, by the way, have done an amazing job of every year giving us an ability to continue to grow our programs. All right, good stuff. Next thing. It was said in there that when the whole basketball school comment happened this summer, in Kyle's article it was said that you, uh, that Calipari wanted to apologize and you would not let him. Is that true? And if not, what's, what is the story as, as, as far as you consider it? Yeah, no, so I think we're, if we go back in the way back machine and we walk through that scenario, a um, couple different things. One, um, for that early part, um, when the team was in the Bahamas um, and I was at CFP meetings or somewhere I was traveling uh, as we began our fall camp in football and all that transpired. A couple of things happened and um, I was coming back from off the road and I said, let's stop the chatter. We didn't need to get into um, more public debate. I wanted the two guys to be able to, to work to get it put behind them for them to visit and for them to move on. And they have done that. Both of them have said they talk. It's behind them, you know, and, and that's where we are. So, yeah, I did say stop the chatter. I didn't say no one could apologize. I would hope absolutely to the spot where um, my two most pro- high-profile coaches um, absolutely make sure that they're on the same page and, and, and moving forward. And they have, they have done that, and they put it behind them, and both of them have moved on, and they, they're going to do what they do and, and representing our program and, and going on. So, uh, that's what that was. Okay, well, 
the, I understand that. The, at the time, then, you had said to him, don't speak publicly. It was the case that a couple days later there was a press conference with, with Mark Stoops, which he, need, which he had to do anyway, and then you went and talked on it. The article suggested Cal might be upset that you had told him not to speak, and then you and Mark did speak. In hindsight, do you wish that had gone differently? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I mean, uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty, Matt. I mean, it's. I mean, I'm I'm really good looking back. You know, it's. Uh, you know, when you're in the in the in the crucible or you're in the crosshairs of it, you know, it's. Um, at the time, I just didn't think it was healthy. Um, I always take the, the podium in the in the fall before we begin our uh, season. Usually, I do it the same day as Fan Day, which would have been a week earlier. However, I, again, I think I was at CFP meetings, I was college football playoff meetings. If I'm not mistaken, that's where I was. I, I don't know. Or I was at SECs, one or the other. Um, so, and then I came back, and so I said, well, I'll do my um, normal deal that I normally do and address some of this stuff. And I just felt like it was important to to you know let everybody know we're. You know, we, we're a big family. You know, Matt, I'm not going to lie to you. We're a big old family. I got 275 employees, and I got 600 student athletes. And if you think that families don't have squabbles from time to time, you're wrong. Families have squabbles, and we, we find our way through it. You know, but at the end of the day, I do know one thing. I know how much Mark Stoops loves Kentucky as evidence that he's signed on to stay here and be a part of our program. I know that Cal loves Kentucky, and I know he loves this place, and I know that he has been here for almost 14 years now. I know I love Kentucky. I've been here 21 years, and I know the venom with which some of the emails I've gotten in the last 24, 48 hours, people wish I wasn't from here, and that's okay, too. I get that. They have the right to that. But I will tell you, um, I love this place. I've devoted two decades of my life to this place. I've devoted an awful lot of, of sweat equity to this place. Because I love this state and I love the people. We have built a permanent home here. I know all of you all stop this stuff, this sappy stuff. All right, I get it. But at the end of the day, you know, you've got three people here that have put almost four decades of their lives into this place. Not because, and there's, they can get paid other places, as could I. But we love it here. And we want to make Kentucky the best we can. And so, yeah, we're going to squabble from time to time. It ain't going to be perfect. It ain't always going to be pretty. But at the end of the day, I would hope people would understand when we put that Kentucky shirt on, we're walking out representing them, and we want to do that to the best we possibly can. I got two more questions, and then I, I, I'll, I'll be glad to let you go. The, the, the next thing in Kyle's article was that Calipari wants from you the ability to get more staff support staff members and maybe even to be able to bring in an offensive or defensive coordinator, et cetera, basically saying he needs more funding for staff. Do you agree? First of all, has he made that request from you? And secondly, is that something you believe he needs? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, again, I'm not. I'm not going to micromanage his his staff. That Cal Cal is the is done this for, I mean, four decades, three de- three and a half decades as a head coach. He knows what he needs at, in terms of the ability to move forward. And if he's got some requests or things that he needs to to. Uh, on staffing issues, I thought we've made we've made some staffing adjustments over the last couple of years. I've tried to fulfill those um, as we as we can. Now we're not, and you know, I think there's some new legislation going on out there that'll be fascinating to see how all that takes place. That was just passed at the NCAA convention in San Antonio. I know you guys aren't tracking on that, or maybe you are, but there's there's this conversation about volunteer assistant coaches that are no longer volunteers; they must be paid. And there, you cannot have volunteers on your staff anymore. You cannot have grad, you can have graduate assistants on your staff, but they can be paid by full-time assistants. So everyone nationally is now going to take a new, have to take a new look and adapt like we adapt on all situations, um, to the new landscape of what does that mean for a volunteer assistant coach? Is it a new full-time assistant coach? Is the graduate assistant the new full-time assistant? And what are the coaching limits on each sport? Each sport is yeah, unique. Mitch, I don't, mean to, I don't mean to cut you off but because I, I just have a couple minutes. But I, the, the, the question is, the question is, has he asked you for staff that you wouldn't give to him? Is that, I guess that's my question. I think we've been helpful to that. I don't, I don't know that any, any requests that's come that I, we have not tried to be helpful, Matt. So, um, but I will always be helpful in that. I try and give our coaches what they need. And I think that's the evidence as you look around. We've done that in every sport. 
All right, last question, and then I'll let you go. I do appreciate you doing this. I, I, they, I, I'll just tell you as a fan and somebody that as a person genuinely likes you both, and I wish personally I had a better relationship with you both, and I, I don't feel like I do. But you two, I think you're both very good guys. I think you both very much care. I don't think your all's relationship is very good. Do you agree with that? And if so, do you think that's something that needs to be fixed for the betterment of UK athletics? I don't think that's true. You know, I think that you know we're, we we come at the world from from a different le- from different lenses in different ways, and because we're different, I don't think that necessarily means it's bad. You know, I, I look at it from one way, he looks at it from another way, and and that's I think that's what makes the world sort of go around. We talk all the time. Um, I, I visit with him after every game. I sit in his office and we chat about what's going on at the game. My, my, my closing question is, what can I do to help you? And that doesn't make it a perfect relationship. We, do, we, do we share um, coffee time every day or do we go to, the, go to dinner often? No, that's not. I don't do it with most of my coaches. I, I, I say hardly any of my coaches. I, just, I let them do their deals. They have <clears throat> excuse me, all-consuming jobs. And I think it's important that there's a little bit of separation in there for them to do that. But I will check in frequently and just say, man, let's go. I stick my nose in. I watch practice from up above in the observatory on many occasions. I don't want to be in their way. That's not who I've been as 20. I've done this 26 years as an AD. I've never done that with my coaches. I stay out of their way and let them do their deal. And at the end of the day, when they call me, they need, their, need help. I generally try, I'm, try to be there for them. And at the end of the day, I do care deeply about Cal. I want to make sure that that he knows how much we appreciate what he's done here. And, and I want him to know, man, that it, this is, he's got probably one of the top five or six hardest jobs in all of, all of college sports. And for certainly it's top, you know, it's one of the top most pressure packed jobs of, of, of sports in general. And so, yeah, I want him to know I care. And, and I don't think it's for anybody on the outside to judge my relationship with him. Um, that's, that's for him and me. And if it works for us, then, then like any other marriage, sometimes marriage is, look different for different people and they work for different ways and and the way some people have managed their their relationship is much different from others but ours ours has worked for 13 years been pretty good and because we're going through a rough patch all of a sudden um we have a a marriage that's that's in, in disarray and i would disagree wholeheartedly with that i think that's probably the best interview mitch has ever done with us um in terms of just like answering the questions he's still you know he and Cal shared the deal that they sort of take a question and turn it into what they're going to say. But I think he said his side on most of this. I believe most of what he says. I don't know if he and Cal talk all the time, but you know what? I mean, if it's they probably talk more than maybe that article acted like. That's my take on it. Ryan, what's yours? I agree. I, it was an outstanding interview, and I think Mitch did himself a lot of favors by some of the things he said. Big Blue Nation needed to hear those things from our leader. He is our leader, and we need to hear some of the things he said. I thought he did a great job. Right, uh, Drew. Uh, it was good to hear from him, and I, I, he actually did better than I expected, and I wish we'd hear from him more. I thought he did See, a good I job. I agree. If yeah. he was going to be like that, he should talk more. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the one in August, I hope he never does that again. But uh, <laughs> I thought the practice facility thing really helped, because we all kind of assumed you need more than $30 million and it takes time and all that. It was good to hear him actually say that. And that that thirty million didn't just sit in an account somewhere. That that's kind of thinking he could get it. The one thing he kind of countered Cal on was this: he's got it. Yeah. He said, "I think he believes he has it." I think those are two different things. I yeah. believe that for me, that was the biggest part of the interview. The whole story of thirty million sitting around waiting for facilities sounds like that's far from the actual case. And I side with Mitch on that. Although, if it is going to take that long, let's start. Or your facility is going to be five years older when they do get it. Uh, the stuff with the relationship and then him saying don't talk when they held an hour-long press conference, I wasn't with him on that. I mean, Mitch in August told Kyle to stop talking, and then he went and burned it down on a Saturday afternoon, and I was sitting right in front of him. So I'm not really with him there, but the uh, practice right. stuff certainly helped, and I thought overall it was a pretty good interview. Great job on your part on your part on the way that you yeah. asked the question and sort of nailed him down on it. That's the most likable, in my opinion, that Mitch Barnhart has ever come ever. across on this show. Did a great job. Well, I appreciate that. Yep. Uh, the only reason, just so you know, I didn't ask him about NIL and alcohol just because I wanted to do this. They have agreed yeah. he's going to come back and talk about that stuff in a month or two. I just we, we only had him for 20 minutes, and, you know, I thought this was the thing that was most. It was. So it's not me dodging it. I'll ask him about that stuff, but I thought this stuff was the most pressing, and that's why we did it like that. 